control. If we need your power, we were Lord of all. Sovereign, 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 sovereign. From the skies to the seas and everything that lies in between. Everything that exists in the universe is dispersed by his decree. He's infinitely supreme and orchestrates all things. The one who sits in the heavens and laughs and does whatever he pleases. Who governs the governments and establishes kings. The prince of peace who proceeds of a prophets, presidents, and priests. Who guides the plans of man but lets that man choose freely. While simultaneously exercising divine sovereignty. Who intervenes on the will of man and causes the man to believe. Who appeases the wrath of God that brings peace to his enemies. The Lord of her lords and the king of her all earthly kings, the pervasive power of God displayed through his mighty deeds. The God of our destiny, the author and finisher of faith, with the power to persuade men and sway souls for God's sake. The ultimate source of authority who rules with mercy and grace, but man reduces this attribute to foolish debate. <laughs> You are who you are, and you will never fail to be who you are. Always on time, always in control. Every knee should bow. You are Lord of all, sovereign, sovereign. Yeah, yeah, sovereign, sovereign. Yeah, yeah, sovereign, sovereign. Yeah, yeah, sovereign, sovereign. Who is majesty, glory, and power belong to? Who is righteous in all his ways and never wrong? Who is God sovereign? Who is awesome? Who do all men depend on for life and breath? The author of life and death, the often overlook what still he's all seeing, all knowing, holding all creation in its place. The God of wrath and grace, the one who can crush every idle man would rather chase and leave men to the narrow gate. Through these crooked paths we navigate, this world exists because you commanded it. So is your hand in it? Or have you? Over the man that turned away and abandoned it. Did you try your best and then left man to handle the rest? Will your plans find success or should we second guess? When world leaders are deceivers, eager to pump their chest. It's like a game of chess. Do you have these things in check? With so much evil, how can we believe you good? But I finally understood when I saw that man nailed to wood. Hey everybody, this is Jonathan with the Hope Movement. This is uh, Theology Famine Relief. Um, and we are now in session 18, so 18 weeks we've been doing in the English version, theology. Um, so we've been going through, we, we did cover some topics in the beginning, um, the depravity of man, um, as well as cover some um, uh, things on racism, a, a biblical view of racism, uh, as well as the sufficiency of scripture. Um, and we've been going through the perfections or attributes of God. We've been doing this for um, uh, about probably about out of the 18 weeks. We've probably been doing this about 15 weeks or more. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. And so this is something we've been really anxious about getting to because it's such a topic that is important. It's, it's fundamental in our Christian faith. Uh, and, and it's something that is not spoken about. Um, by pastors and, and churches around around the world, for that matter. And most people, when you say, what is the sovereignty of God? People say, well, he's, he's, he's in control of things. And notice that, that, little, that little last part there. He's in control of things. But nobody wants to say he's in control of all, all things. And I think that, a, a, and I've used this analogy um, kind of analogy, but um, of the sovereignty of God and the will of man. And I think the best way to explain it is that that God is so sovereign that he decrees things into, into, into be. And so 
even our will is bent to his will. And so there's, there's moments that I think uh, some different, maybe like a, a simplistic way of, of uh, explaining it would be that um, if, you're, if you're looking at it from this perspective where um, God is uh, in, 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 act, in moments of our life, um, activities. Obviously, he's always in control. He's always sovereign. But just using it in in respect to um, our daily lives. So you'll see that he's he's always in control. But then there's moments where like situations are completely under the control of God. Um, and then you're gonna and then then you're going and you, you're kind of following along with his will. And then there's moments that he uses your mistakes and errors and decisions and things that would be your will and he uses that and so he's even in that he's guiding your that that situation to follow where he wants you to go and so i think that's a good way to to kind of look at it but again if you have a very low view of god then this is going to be something that's going to be hard for you um to to get a hold of because people don't want uh, the the view that we have of god is a very low view as a God that needs us, um, that's dependent upon us, whereas we are created for his glory. And so he was satisfied in the Trinity, um, full of love, full of uh, uh, self-sufficient, um, it just uh, and, and always existent, never created, and were satisfied in, in, with that love and yet made this plan. So to demonstrate his power and his glory uh, through the plan of salvation and, and, and of, uh, of mankind. And so uh, this is something that uh, we're going to get into. We're going to go in through um, a lot of different areas. We're gonna co- today we're going to cover an intro to the sovereignty of God. We're going to touch on some the supremacy of God, which is connected to that. Um, we probably won't have time today, um, but we're going to keep this as more of an intro today. And then we're going to have, um, so then you, we're, we'll touch on the, the decrees of God. And then we're going to get into some deep stuff that he's um, sovereign over creation. He's sovereign over administration, over governments. Um, the, the, the proverb says that kings are like water through his fingers. And so, um, so he's even in charge of that. And so these are some important topics that we're going to be touching on. So this is probably going to be a several week um, study that we're going to be doing on the sovereignty of God. We want to do it right. And, you know, this is something also another emphasis to say. Um, we have different groups of people in Christianity that um, have these labels um, and that um, these groups of people and they call the, you know, we call ourselves, you know, uh, affiliate ourselves with these groups of people because that group of people maybe are, have that, that, that shared biblical view, and um, and I think that that is having that biblical view obviously is great. Um, but I think sometimes when we put a label on that, besides just saying this is biblical theology, it's that's it. It's uh, um, and I think that it it creates it hurts our our efforts in preaching the truth in the true gospel, um, and so. Um, we want to make make clear of that that we're going to be focusing on biblical theology, and um, there's going to be things that you're not going to understand, and it's okay. Um, it, an authentic faith is um, not just someone who um, believes in God, but someone that believes God, just believes Him. Okay, your word your word says this. I believe it. I don't understand it. Um, my instinct is to say that it's not it's not just or doesn't make sense or whatever, but I trust you, I love you, and I, I believe that your ways are the only way, and it's the best way, and you know better than us, and you are in heaven, and you do whatever you please, and I trust that because you're working all things for your glory and my good, and so just as the shirt says, in case you can't see it, keep calm, God is sovereign. So, so a little shout out with the the pit, the, the t-shirts we make these uh, for the Hope Movement, and it goes towards uh, um, the work of the Hope Movement around the world. So, um, Amazon.com. <laughs> so, anyway, so let's get into this and talk about the sovereignty of God. So, this is going to be the intro. We're going to cover 
um, an intro to sovereignty of God. Um, then we'll cover the supremacy of God, the decrees of God we'll be doing next week, and we'll get into a lot of verses. There's tons that we'll be going through. And then over the coming weeks, we're going to go through uh, how he's sovereign over um, various all situations, uh, but we're going to be covering specific ones, creation, administration, and so forth, um, salvation as well. And so um, I, I hope that you will stay tuned with this, share it with your friends. Um, this is an important message that will change your life. Charles Spurgeon once said that the sovereignty of God is the pillow you can rest your head upon. When you understand that God is in control of all things, then you can rest and you can understand. It's not to say we don't worry because we are sinful people and we allow sin it causes to, to, to worry and so forth. But we need to repent of that. I, I'm, we're, I'm guilty of that. We're all guilty of that. And so we just need to, we need to preach the gospel to us ourselves each and every day, not just to other people, to ourselves to remind us he's sovereign and this, and, and this is the gospel that, uh, and, and just preach that to yourself because it's going to encourage you uh, in your walk with Christ. So the sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of, of his supremacy, uh, infinitely elevated above the highest creature, he is the most high, Lord of heaven and earth, subject to none, influenced by none, absolutely independent. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases, and none can thwart him. None can hinder him. So his own word expressly declares, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, 10. He, do, he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand. Daniel 4, 35. Divine sovereignty means that God is God in fact as well as in name that he is on the throne of the universe directly directing all things working all things after the counsel of god of his own will ephesians 1 11. so rightly did charles the late charles um Haddon spurgeon say in a sermon on matthew 20 15 and he said this there is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of god's sovereignty under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that the sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, and the sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for, for which the children ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne. On the other hand, there is no doctrine more hated by the world, and to be honest, by many professing Christians. No truth of, of which they have made such a football as the great and stupendous but yet most certain doctrine of, of sovereignty of God of infinite Jehovah. Men will allow God to be any, everywhere except on his throne. They will allow him to be in his workshop to fashion worlds and make stars. They will allow him to be um, in, uh, in, his, uh, om, in, in his omni to dispense his alms and, dis, and bestow his bounties. They will allow him to sustain the earth and bear up the pillars thereof or light the lamps of heaven or rule the heavens, I mean, the, rule the, the waves uh, of the ever-moving ocean. But when God ascends his throne, his creatures then gnash their teeth. And we proclaimed an enthroned God and his right to do all he wills with his own, to dispose of his creatures as he thinks well, without consulting them in the matter. Then it is that we are hissed and... Uh, a, 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 this is hated, and, and they hate this, this sovereign God. And when it is that men turn a deaf ear to us, for God is on the throne, is not the, the God they love, but it is God upon the throne that we love to preach, and it is God upon the throne whom we trust. It was by Charles Spurgeon. Whosoever the Lord pleased, 
that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in the deep places. Psalms 135.6. Such is the mighty, uh, uh, potent, uh, uh, revealed in the Holy Writ, in the Bible. Unraveled in majesty, unlimited in power, unaffected by anything outside of himself. But we are living in a day when even the most orthodox seem afraid to admit the proper godhood of God. They say that to press the sovereignty of God excludes human re responsibility, whereas human responsibility is based upon divine sovereignty and is the product of it. But our God is in the heavens and he does he has done whatever he has pleased. Psalms 115.3. He sovereignly chose to place each of his creatures on that particular footing, which seemed good in his sight. He created angels. Some he pleased, placed in a conditional footing. Others he gave an, an immutable standing before him. 1 Timothy 5.21. Making Christ their head. Colossians 2.10. Let it not be overlooked that the angels which sinned, 2 Peter 2, 5, were as much his creatures as the angels that sinned not. Yet God foresaw they would fall. Nevertheless, he placed them on a mutable creature, conditional footing, and suffered them to fall, though he was not the author of their sin. To God sovereignly placed Adam in the Garden of Eden upon a conditional footing. He had, he, had he so pleased, he could have placed him upon an unconditional footing, meaning that he could have been placed on a footing uh, as firm as the, that occupied by the unfallen angels. He could have placed him upon a footing uh, as sure and as immutable or unchanging as that which his saints have in Christ. Instead, he chose to set him in Eden on the basis of creature responsibility so that he stood or fell according to how he measured up or failed to the measured up, up to his responsibility. Let me say it again. So that he stood or fell according to how he measured up or failed to me measure up to his responsibility, obedience to his maker. Adam stood to accountable stood accountable to God by the law which his creator had given him. Here was a responsibility, unimpaired responsibility tested under the most favorable conditions. God did not place Adam upon a footing of conditional creature responsibility because it was right he should so place him. No, it was right because God did it. God did not even give creatures being because it was right for him to do so. For example, because he was under any obligation to create, but it was right because he did so. God is sovereign and he will be he his will is supreme. So far from God being under any law of right, he is the law a law unto himself, so that whatever he does is right. Woe be to the rebel that calls to his sovereign and sovereignty into question. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the, the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth what, what makest thou? Isaiah 45, 9. And as you can see, that's an old translation. Again, the Lord sovereignly placed Israel upon a conditional footing. Exodus 19, 20, and 24 afford a full proof of this. They were placed under a covenant of works. God gave them certain laws. National blessings for them depended upon their observance of these statutes. But Israel was stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. They rebelled against Jehovah, forsook his law, turned Unto, un, unto fa false gods, apostatize. In consequence, divine judgment fell upon them, and they were delivered into the hands of their enemies, dispersed abroad through the, throughout the earth, and remain under the heavy frown of God's displeasure to this day. It was God, in the exercise of his sovereignty, that placed Satan and, and his angels, Adam and Israel, 
in their respective responsible positions. But so far from his sovereignty taking away responsibility from the creature, it was the, the exercise of it that he, that he placed them on this conditional footing under such responsibilities as he thought proper. By virtue of his sovereignty, he is seen to be God over all. Thus, there is a perfect harmony between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of the creature. Many have more foolishly said that it is, a, it is quite possible to show where d divine sovereignty ends and creature accountability it begins. Here is where creature responsibility begins, in the sovereignty, sovereign ordination of the cre creator. As to his sovereignty, there is not and ever will be, never will be, any end to it. Let us see further proofs that the responsibility of the creature is based upon God's sovereignty. How many things are recorded in the scripture which were right because God commanded them, which would not have been right um, had he had not commanded? What right had Adam to eat of the trees of the garden? The permission of his maker? Genesis 2.16. Without such, he would have been a thief. What right had Israel to borrow the, uh, the Egyptian, of the Egyptians' jewels and, and uh, raiment? Exodus 12.35. None, unless Jehovah had authorized it. Exodus 3.22. What right had Israel to slay so many lambs for sacrifice? None, except that God commanded it. What right had Israel to kill off all of the Canaanites? None, only as Jehovah had bidden them. What right had the husband to require submission from his wife? None, unless God had appointed it. So we might go on, human responsibility is based on divine sovereignty. One more example of the exercise of God's absolute sovereignty. God places elect upon a different footing than Adam or Israel. He placed them upon an unconditional footing. In the everlasting covenant, Jesus Christ was appointed their head, took their responsibilities upon himself, and wrought out righteousness for them, which is perfect, un undefeasible, uh, eternal. And Christ was placed upon a conditional footing. For he was made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. But with this infinite difference that others, the others failed, he did not and could not. Who placed Christ upon that, un that conditional footing? The triune God. It was, sovereign. it was sovereign will that appointed him, sovereign love that sent him, sovereign authority that assigned his work. Certain conditions were set before the mediator. He was to be made in the likeness of sin's flesh. He was to, be, to magnify the law and make it honorable. He was to bear all the sins of all God's people in his own body on the tree. He was to make full atonement for them. He was to endure the outpouring wrath of God. He was to die and be buried. And on the fulfillment of those conditions, he was promised a reward, Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. He was to be the firstborn among many brethren. He was to have a people who should share his glory. Blessed be his name forever. He fulfilled those conditions. Because he did so, the Father stands pledged on solemn oath to preserve through time and bless throughout eternity every one of those for whom he, his incarnate son mediated. Because he took their place, they now share the, his. His righteousness is theirs. His standing before God is theirs. His life is theirs. There is not a single condition for them to meet, not a single responsibility for them to discharge in order to attain their eternal bliss. By one offering he hath protected forever them that are sanctified, Hebrews 10, 14. Here then is the sovereignty of God openly displayed before all, displayed in the different ways in which 
he was, has dealt with his creatures. Part of the angels, Adam, Israel, were placed upon conditional footing. Continued blessing was dependent upon their obedience and fidelity to God. But in sharp contrast, the little flock, Luke 12, 32, have been given an unconditional and immutable standing in God's covenant, God's counsel, God's son. Their blessing is dependent upon what Christ did for them. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, 2 Timothy 2.19. The foundation on which God's elect stand is a perfect one. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it, Ecclesiastes 3.14. Here then is the, the highest and grandest display of the absolute sovereignty of God. He has mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will, he will hardeneth. Romans 9.18 So, we'll go over real quickly the supremacy of God. And this is in connection with the sovereignty of God. This is so such an important aspect of his sovereignty. And then we'll get into next week the, the decrees of God. And this is something that's super profound that um, I, this should just really be blowing your mind and just be getting you in a, in a place where you're just in all of God. And also should give you some peace in knowing that he's in control of all things. And so this is interesting that um, in, in one of, the, of his letters, Luther said, your thoughts of God are too human. Probably that renowned scholar resented such a rebuke um, as, in that he, he had wrote this letter to a scholar. And, and the more so since it proceeded from a, a minor son, right? So this, this, this uh, lowly person writing this letter to this uh, scholar. Nevertheless, it was thoroughly deserved. We, too, prefer the same charge against the vast majority of the preachers of our day and against those, instead of searching the scriptures for themselves, lazily accept their teachings. The most dishonoring conceptions of, of the rule and reign of the Almighty are now held almost everywhere. To countless thousands, even professing Christians, the God of Scripture is quite unknown. Of old, God compl complained to an, to an apostate uh, Israel, Thou, thou uh, thoughtest that I altogether such, oh, excuse me, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such one as thyself. In other words, you thought I'm just like you, Psalms 50:21. Such must uh, now be the indict in in indictment against the apostate uh, Christendom of today. Men imagine the Most High is moved by sentiment rather than by principle. They suppose his uh, uh, omni omnipotency is such an idle fiction that Satan can he can outdo and out he can uh, he can manipulate. Uh, and, and change the designs uh, uh, that God has made on every side. They think that uh, if he was formed, has formed any plan or purpose at all, then it must be like theirs, a constantly subject to change. They openly declare that whatever power he possesses must be restricted, lest he invade... Uh, of man's free will and reduce him to a machine. They lower all in, uh, infectious atonement, which redeems everyone for whom it was made, to a merely remedy, which sin sick souls may use if they feel so disposed. They lessen the strength of the invincible work of the Holy Spirit to an offer. Of, of the gospel which sinners may accept or reject as they please. And we've used the altar call and the, the Lord's prayer. Just say this prayer when it's got to be the Holy Spirit to do the work. And there's so many people that have been deceived by that. 
Not to say that God can't use uh, an altar call or to repeat a prayer, but it's not because of that prayer or because of that preacher to say, repeat this prayer. It's in spite of that preacher. It's in spite of that, that method. It's because the Holy Spirit was doing the work in them. The God of this century no more resembles the sovereign of the holy writings of the Bible than does the dim flickering of a candle, the glory in the midday sun. The God who is talked about in the average pulpit, spoken of in, this, in the ordinary Sunday school, mentioned uh, in, in much of religious literature of the day, and preached in, um, in most of the so-called Bible conferences, is a figment of human imagination, an invention of, of, of sentimentality. The heathen outside of the of of uh, of the church of Christianity form gods of wood and stone, while millions of heathen inside of the church manufacture a god out of their own carnal minds. In reality, they are but atheists, for there is no other possible alternative between an absolutely supreme god and no god at all. A god whose Will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose purpose is checkmated, possesses no title to deity, and far from being a fit object of worship, merits nothing but contempt. The supremacy of the true and living God might well be argued from an infinite dis distance, which separates the mightiest creatures from, from the Creator. He is the potterer. They are but the clay in his hands to be molded in the vessels of honor or to be dashed into pieces, Psalms 2.9, as he pleases. Where all the, where all the, the, uh, the, the, the inhabitants of heaven and all the inhabitants of earth to combine an open uh, revolt against him, it would cause him no uneasiness. It would have less effect upon his eternal, unsaleable throne than the spray of the Mediterranean waves has upon the towering rocks. And so powerless is the creature to affect the Most High. Scripture tells us that when the Gentile heads unite with apostate Israel to defy Jehovah and his Christ, he that sitteth on the heavens in the heavens shall laugh. Psalms 2 4. The absolute and universal supremacy of God is plainly affirmed in many scriptures. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and all and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all, and thou reignest over all. First Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. Note, reignest now, not will you do in the millennium, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over the kingdoms of the, of the heathen, and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none, not even the devil himself, is able to withstand thee. Second Chronicles, the twenty-six before him, presidents and popes, kings and emperors are less than grasshoppers. But he is the one. But he, but he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desires, even he hath he he does. Job twenty-three thirteen. My reader, the God of Scripture is no make-believe monarch, no imaginary sovereign, but king of kings, uh, lord of lords. I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought of my, of thine can be hindered, Job 42.2. Or another translator, no purpose of thine can be frustrated. All that he has designed, he does. All that he has decreed, he perfects. All that he has promised, he performs. 
But our God is in the heavens, and he has hath done what whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalms 115.3. Why has he? Because there is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Proverbs 21.30. God's supremacy over the, the works of his hands is vividly depict, depicted in Scripture. Irrational creatures all perform their maker's bidding. At his pleasure, the Red Sea divided, and its waters stood up as walls. Exodus 14. The earth opened her mouth, and guilty rebels went down alive into the pit. Numbers 14. When he so ordered, the sun stood still. Joshua 10. And on another occasion, went backward 10 degrees on the dial. To exemplify his supremacy, he made ravens carry food to Elijah. 1 Kings 17. Iron to float on the waters. 2 Kings 6.5. Lions to be tamed when Daniel was cast into their den. Fire to burn, not when three Hebrews were flung into the flames. Thus whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did, that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and all the deep places. Psalms 135.6. His supremacy is also demonstrated in his perfect rule over the wills of men. Ponder carefully Exodus 34.24. Three times in the year, all the males of Israel were required to leave their homes and go up to Jerusalem. They lived in the midst of a hostile people who hated them for having appropriated um, their lands. What then was to hinder the Canaanites from seizing an, the opportunity during the absence of the men to enslave the women and children and take possessions of their farms if the hand of the Almighty was not upon the wills even of wicked men? How could he make this promise beforehand that none should so much as desire their lands? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water he turneth, it wh whithersoever he will. Proverbs 21.1 But so, some may object. Do we not read again and again in scripture how men defied God, resisted his will, broke his commandments, disregarded his warnings, and turned a deaf ear to all of his uh, exhortations? Certainly we do. Does this nullify all that all we have said? If so, then plainly, then plainly the Bible contradicts itself. But that cannot be. What the objectors refer to is simply the wickedness of men against the external word of God. We have mentioned what God has purposed in himself, the rule of conduct he has given us to walk by the perfect by his perfectly per, uh, fulfilled Excuse me. He has given us to walk by his by by his perfectly fulfilled is by none of us. His own external counsels are accomplished to his uh, to the to the to the, the littlest details. The absolute and universal supremacy of God is affirmed with equal positiveness positiveness in the New Testament. We are told that God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11. The Greek for worketh means to work uh, effectually. For this reason we read, for him, for of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever, amen, Romans 11.36. Uh, Men may boast they are free agents with a will of their own, and are at liberty to do as they please. But scripture says to those who boast, we will go into such a city and continue there for uh, continue there a year and buy and sell. Ye ought to say, if the Lord will. James 4, 13 and 15. Here then is a sure resting place for the heart. Our lives are neither the product of blind fate nor the result of, of chance. Every detail of them has ordained was ordained from from etern all eternity and is now ordered by the living reigning god not a hair of our heads can be touched without his permission a man's heart devises his ways his way but the lord directeth his steps
Proverbs 16, 9. What assurance, what strength, what comfort this should give the real Christian. My times are in thy hand. Psalms 31, 15. Then let me rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalms 37, 7. So this is an a introduction to the sovereignty of God. And we're going to be getting into his, um, his, uh, the, a lot of verses um, in these coming weeks. Um, we're going to have some discussions. Um, uh, maybe possibly I might be bringing in some couple, a couple of friends that will be able to have some discussions about this topic as well. Um, and so um, please stay tuned. Join us. And, um, and we're going to get into some deep stuff. Um, so this was just the intro. Um, next week we'll get into the decrees of God, um, and um, then we're going to get into some of the into the nitty gritty <laughs> and the details of of uh, of His sovereignty. So I hope that you have a blessed evening, uh, blessed weekend, and uh, we'll see each other next week. Um, for those who speak Spanish, we'll be meeting um, on Monday, um, as we always do at six o'clock. Um, and then on Thursday, um, we'll be meeting at 5.30, so continuing the sovereignty of God. So we look forward to seeing you. May you have a blessed, uh, a blessed evening and grace and peace.